It's hard to tell. Uh, all right, let's see. All right, uh, Jonathan, you're on the screen. Go with the first question. Well, actually, just quickly, apropos of Aaron, could you, you've said this in the past, but just again, apropos of your point about people in the White House listening, could you yep. briefly tell the story of how Ayn Rand's influence helped change the draft in America today? Because it was a big issue, you know, was it 35, 40 years ago? And a lot of people don't know that. And there's a little story that I'd love if you would share with me so I know it once again. Sure. I mean, um, as, as uh, hopefully everybody knows, in the 1960s, there was a draft in the United States. If you were 18, you were drafted into the Army. There were some exceptions. If you went to college, uh, but when you graduated from college, theoretically, you could be drafted. I don't know the details, but uh, th there was a draft. The Vietnam War was not fought with the volunteer army like the wars are today, but it was fought with an army of uh, conscripted uh, adults, conscripted young men and women. I think it was I think it was only men, but uh, Ayn Rand opposed the draft on the beginning. I mean, she considered the draft to be evil. Uh, it, it, it's you know talk about coercion and and using coercion by the state in order for you know to exercise state power to go to wars that the president and the state have decided are good wars uh, to to sacrifice your life whether you believe in the war or not. So she was a huge opponent of the draft and wrote about it in the 1960s and spoke about it in the 1960s. And there were a number of people in the Nixon administration who affiliated with Ayn Rand in those days. And maybe the, the most uh, prominent in this context, probably the most important one was Martin Anderson. Um, and Martin Anderson was appointed to a committee that, uh, that Nixon uh, put together to study the draft after he got elected in 1968. And the committee came back with a recommendation to eliminate the draft, which motivated Nixon ultimately to eliminate the draft. And I do not know the date of when he actually eliminated the draft. It was in the early 1970s. And Martin Anderson was, was clearly an influence in that committee. And he was, he was one of Ayn Rand's kind of circle, one of the people uh, in the so-called collective, one of the people attending some of the meetings and, and heavily influenced by Ayn Rand. There were probably others in that committee influenced by her. At the time, there were really only two prominent intellectuals on the right advocating for the elimination of the, of the draft. And those were Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman. And both of them, in a sense, had representatives or had influence on the people on the committee that did away with the draft. And, and there's no question in her mind that she had a strong... Um, there's a strong causal relationship between her advocacy against the draft and the elimination of the draft. I think her and Milton Friedman were probably the two most important intellectual, public intellectuals in the 1960s and 70s advocating for pro-individual uh, rights and pro-capitalist positions, even though, of course, she was much more principled and much more consistent in those positions. Milton Friedman was... It depended on the issue, and, and he often compromised in disastrous ways. Indeed, both of them probably made, you know, the, um, the word capitalism cool again. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, capitalism was a swear word. It was a, it was a negative term. And by the 1970s, late 1970s, early 1980s, by the time Ronald Reagan is elected, capitalism is a positive word. And again, I think that's, that's Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, Capitalism Not Known Ideal, and, and Milton Friedman uh, with his books on capitalism. Do you, do you think, I'll just quick follow up, yeah. do, you, do you foresee that the draft could ever make a comeback in this country? Yeah, I do. Maybe, maybe not quite as a draft, but there's been a lot of talk, both on the right and the left, about public service, about taking teenagers uh, 18 and, and having you either join the military or do some kind of public service for a year or two. Um, you know, George Bush supported this. I, I'd be shocked if Donald Trump doesn't support it. And certainly people on the left support it. So as we see an increase in nationalism, as we see greater and greater frustration with so-called, uh, you know, snowflake generation or, or though, you know, people, we continue to to, to describe young people as, 
weak and pathetic and and uh, ignorant there'll be more and more interest in actually uh bringing back some kind of national or, or instituted some kind of national service to, for the cause for for a cause greater than yourself you know uh, and and to 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 and i hear people all the time say yeah what these kids need is they need to go into the army they need they need to be beaten up in the army a little bit just to just a whip into shape to get them straight now. They, you know, they'll, they'd be so much better if they went into the army, like those Israeli kids, you know, they, they, they need some of that. Um, Did, didn't the Institute years ago have a protest against volunteerism? Yeah, so during the Clinton years, I think it was Clinton years, but it was really promoted by George Bush Senior and others. Volunteerism was a big issue and, and the idea of national service became a big issue. And I think there was National Service Day or something like that, or Volunteer Day was instituted. So there was definitely a variety of different programs and it was a big, big issue. And the Institute had a protest, I think in Philadelphia, opposite Liberty Hall. And we wrote a lot of op ads and we wrote a lot of stuff about that issue. It was, it was a good issue for us because who else is gonna stand up against volunteerism? Um, nobody. So uh, again, left and right. Uh, supported supported that agenda.